today, being from Texas, I'm sitting in Texas watching the church on the, on the internets <laughs> and watching Pastor Dan boil a Twinkie. I live in Texas. Twinkie is easy. In the, Texas, in the Texas State Fair, I don't know if you've ever visited the Texas State Fair. I mean, it is a, a deep frying contest. I mean, that, man, there, if you research this on the internet, they had the top 25 items that are deep fried. I always tell people, even at the state fair, they deep fry napkins. <laughs> Here's the top one that they deep fry, bacon. Deep fry bacon, that sounds, I'm like, that's not bad. <laughs> I need to try that one. I'm from Virginia, though. I'm a Texas transplant. So all of this stuff is weird, so especially this one. Deep fried butter. <laughs> they take deep fried butter, sprinkle it with some stuff to make it taste good. That just sounds like a heart attack. Some clogged arteries. This next one is very interesting. Deep fried Coca-Cola. I was gonna say deep fried Coke, but I was like, no, that don't sound. <laughs> <laughs> Deep fried Coke. This, this, is, this is crazy. It gets worse. I like the taste of Coke. Here's a picture of some deep fried jelly beans. They take jelly beans, dip them in the batter, batter and put them in the boiling oil. Last one, another heart attack. It's deep fried hot dog breaded in french fries. <laughs> These are just five. I, I, I couldn't show you all 20, 25. They even have deep fried part tarts. I know it. Somebody said, what exactly? So again, being from Virginia, when I came to Texas and started seeing all this deep fried, I'm like, Texans are crazy. But there's one thing that I tasted and I said, oh my goodness. Ah, this is so good. I need to do this with Gold Creek. So today, we're deep frying Oreos. Woo oh my goodness. You don't understand. I, when I first heard these, I was like, y'all are really crazy. The Oreos already give me a headache. There's a legend in our family that somebody in our family ate a whole roll of Oreos and the Oreos involuntarily came out. <laughs> so why would you deep fry an Oreo? But as ridiculous as it sounds, one day I tasted it and my life was changed. <laughs> and so it's so good I want to share this with you all. And just like I thought this idea was ridiculous. It was such a foreign concept, but it changed my life. There's this product that God wants his children to experience in 1 John chapter 3 that will change your life and change the lives of others. And so we're going to walk through this product. And we're going to walk through 1 John 3, and we're going to look at this product but in order to get the product, there's a prep, all right? So there's product and the prep. You got it? Product and the prep. Y'all gonna make me do this by myself, really? There's a product and... All right, okay, all right. So you got the product, the prep, and then there's this process. The product... All right, sorry, that, that's, that's three points. That's the three points. When you go home, somebody said, what did he talk about? Talk about at church. You don't got to say Jesus. You can say he talked about a product, the prep, and the process. First John, let's talk about the prep first. First John chapter 3 and verse 1 says this. See how much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. And that is what we are. 
such a beautiful, sweet sentence. This is the first part of verse 1. It says, see this? This is, this is, this is great. He, this sentence is sandwiched with positivity. He says, man, see this, that our Father loves us and that he's called us his children and that we are. Don't forget it. Know this. Now, this, this is a miracle. Let me explain to you this miracle. We were all born. And there's this theological idea called total depravity. In other words, you were born into this world, and this world is jacked up. And so since you were born into this world, guess what you were? Jacked up. All of us were born in this world, and there's none righteous. All of us are messed up. But the holy God who created this universe loved you enough to adopt you into his family. He loved me enough to adopt me and call me his child. And so John says this, here's the prep. In order to get the world and God's children this, this product that God wants everybody to taste, understand this first of all, that you are loved by God <laughs> and God has called you his child and then he says, and that you show enough all. You can take that to the bank. God loved you, listen. God loved me. It might not excite you about me saying that God loves me, but I know me. I know how messed up Jason was and would be without him. And God loves Jason and calls Jason his child. Aha! Nan, nanny, boo boo. Mm. So he says this don't forget it. Get this into your thick skull. If you have trusted Jesus as your Savior, God loves you and called you his, and that you show enough is. <laughs> I know some of y'all, I, I said that wrong on purpose, FYI. <laughs> you, you, you certainly are his child. Here's why you need to get that. Second part of the verse says this, but the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are his children. They don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. The people of this world don't understand who God is. And because they don't understand who God is, they're not going to understand who you are as his child. But what they think shouldn't have any influence on what you think about yourself because he has chosen you. But they don't recognize it. So the people of this world, when you do righteous things, they won't understand why you do righteous things. When the world hates and you don't hate back, they don't understand that. Because they don't know God. It's like the mask. I appreciate these masks. But the one thing I don't like about them is it's difficult to tell who people are sometimes. You, has anybody ever spoke to you and you're like, hey, why are you speaking to me like you know me? And then they do like this. Like, it's me. You're like, oh, okay. <laughs> or you got to do it to somebody. Like, hey, what's up? You're like, oh, hey, what's going on? So here's what I want to tell you. Single ladies, listen to me. If you have pretty eyes and an ugly face, <laughs> this is your season, girl. Wear that mask. You know what I'm saying? Like, wear it. Wear it proud. <laughs> For such a time as this, boo-boo. Yeah. <laughs> Fellas, single brothers, if you got decent eyes and you ugly or your breath stinks, brother, <laughs> come on. <laughs> The instant in season, out of season now, brother. Hey, hey, this covers your breath. You don't know that your breath stink? This is your time. Talk to her. Shoot your shot, man. Go for it. <laughs> uh. 
Because the mask hides some stuff. Take your time. You better laugh. Let your laugh out because you're going to pass gas. That's going to be embarrassing. <laughs> so this, the world is blinded. It's, it can't see us. But we are God's children. And even though the world doesn't recognize it, it does not change that I am God's child. It's funny. Um, what, do you, what do your parents, what do you do that you couldn't stand for your parents to do? Anything? Is there anything that plucked your nerves that your parents did you find yourself doing? <laughs> Tell the truth. There's things now I do, it, may, it reminds me of my dad. There's certain things that reminds me of my mom. There's certain things that my dad would do that will pluck my nerves. Now, I do the same thing to my kids, like, oh, snap. And what I've learned in that process is, like, I am my daddy's child. I am Robert Earl Sr.'s son. I am Karen Earl's son. And there are certain things that they did that I, it's, it's in my DNA, I'm going to do it. So, little underscoring side point is if you have issues with your parents and can't stand them, you better get it straight because ultimately you're going to hate yourself. <laughs> there are moments, I, you know, I've been frustrated as a young adult with my dad and I find myself doing it. I'm like, why am I doing that? Stop, hand, stop pointing like that. You point just like your dad. When you're his child, you cannot hide it. You give me a five to seven month old child, this is my favorite stage of babies. When they're in that five to seven month old stage, they cannot communicate with their mouth. And you can, if you're paying attention, you can see everything that they want to say. You give me a baby and you can bring four men in the room. I can tell you who the father is. Because the baby can't talk. So when the dad walks in, all the other men will walk in and the baby just looks. But when dad walks in, the baby like. <laughs> I love that stage. That's, that's my litmus test of a dad. I can tell if I'm loving my child enough where they recognize my love as, as a baby at that stage. And every time I walk in the house, they're like, they start ticking. <laughs> and if they're really excited, they start scramming and trying to get out the chair. And they don't even know how to get out the chair. We are God's kids. And there's a certain response that we have from God. So prep point number one is we're God's kids. You got that? Prep point number two, this is another good one. My goodness. He's freed us from sin. Oh, oh. Did I just say free us from sin? Oh, Jason, you sure enough did. Oh my goodness. Let's look at verse 4 and verse 5. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law. For all sin is contrary to the law of God. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins. And there is no sin in him. Hmm. You ever wonder what sin is? We know the Bible says all unrighteousness is sin. And some people say, man, I had a bad thought. Did I sin because this bad thought came out of nowhere? Ah, all of us have bad thoughts. They just are involuntary. Am, am I right? <laughs> Y'all don't want to say, Y'all don't want to admit. <laughs> you ever been watching a crime show and the criminal gets caught and you're like, he's so stupid. He could have escaped if he would have just done it like this. Woo! Ladies, ever watch one of those shows about the lady that killed her husband? And y'all watch like, mm-mm-mm, child, girl, no. Mm-mm-mm, here's what she should do. <laughs> you ever seen uh, bank robbers get caught? And you're like, man, if I, was if I was to rob a bank, here's how I would do it. Somebody got a bank robbery plan, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to, like, you don't have to plan to think these horrible thoughts. They just come up. Ah, we can't help that. But when 
horrible thoughts turn into actions, ungodly thoughts turn into ungodly actions, oh, now there's a flag on the play. Or when those ungodly, inappropriate thoughts take up resonance in our hearts so we don't do the action, but man, oh man, every time, <laughs> do we need examples? No, we don't need, okay, you know, we won't do that. We won't do that. But here's what you got to understand. Jesus came to take away the sins of the world. Regardless of how much your heart may conjure up. And knowing that there is none righteous and all of us have sinned, Jesus came to forgive us for our sins. <laughs> Verse 6 says this, anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. What? Hold up. <laughs> I know the other day, I kind of didn't lose my temper totally, but I made the wrong judgment call in my house. <laughs> When I saw that the kitchen wasn't clean, did I? What do you mean he will not sin? But anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is. Here's what he's saying. When you become a follower of Jesus, just like if a person gets hit by a, a Mack truck, if they get hit by a Mack truck, they're going to walk away different. If you accept Jesus Christ, you will walk different. The closer you are to Christ, the further you walk away from sin. So if you truly are in Christ, you cannot have sinful habits and be okay with it. You cannot live in sin and just your heart like, I'm good. No, when you truly are walking with Jesus, sin doesn't sit right with you. When you sin, you got to do something about it. You're like, Lord, I need help. I need to talk to the pastor. What is that text code to the church? I need to get in a connect group or something. I need some help because I'm struggling. It's like an airplane. When I got, when I left Dallas yesterday, the airport was big. But the higher we got, the smaller the airplane, the smaller the airport was. When you're in Christ, some issues seem big, but the higher you grow in Jesus, the smaller the issues come. But here's what you got to understand. Jesus came to forgive you for your sins, but it doesn't stop there. Jesus came to free you from your sins. What? Homework assignment, read Romans chapter six. Romans six says, if you die with Christ and have been made alive with him, don't allow sin to control you. You've been free from it. So here it is. Because I know some people thinking right now, like, man, <laughs> will you shut up, Jason? Because I got this stuff that I'm struggling with, man. If you trusted Jesus to save you, you can trust Jesus to keep you. If the blood of Jesus is powerful enough to save you from hell, the blood of Jesus is powerful enough to keep you from making hellish decisions. If God made something wrong to do, God will help you not do it. God is willing to help you stop the sin that you're doing. The question is, will you allow him to help you? Oh, testimony time. I was a young college student with a lot of energy. You know what I mean, fellas? And I was looking for ways 
There's some kids in here. You got to read between the lines. I was looking for ways to get rid of this energy. Amen, fellas. And there were a group of ladies who wanted... Never mind. No. Y'all know where I'm going, right? No? Y'all, y'all never heard of this stuff before? Like, y'all skipped this lesson? Y'all nervous because I'm being real? Like, what's going on? And here's the thing. There came a point in time where I knew as a Christian that God didn't want me to do this stuff, but I liked it. Can I get an amen before I think it's you? All right, there we go. That work. And I knew Then one day I was like, man, I can't stop this sin. I cannot stop it. And one day it hit me. God, if you made this wrong, you want to help me do what's right. I just got to follow you. Here's what you got to understand. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, 1 John chapter 3. It just so happens that today we're in chapter 3. Pull up verse 8, please. Prakow. Look at what it says. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Oh my goodness. Jesus came to destroy everything that the devil tries to show up in your life. My goodness. So if the devil is trying to destroy your marriage, Jesus came to destroy whatever's trying to destroy your marriage. If the devil is trying to destroy your finances, Jesus came to destroy everything that's trying to destroy your finances. If the devil's trying to destroy your children, Jesus came to destroy every single thing. They came to destroy your children. Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. My goodness, if that don't give you hope right there. This is a verse that whenever I see opposition in my life, that I know that it's coming from the devil. I'm like, Jesus came to destroy it. If that don't encourage you, your encourager is broken. <laughs> that was, insert laugh, okay. <laughs> so God has freed us from sin and he's made of his children. And why has he done that? So that you can experience his love. First of all, he wants you to experience his love. Being in college, my life forever changed. I was a young 19-year-old who had grown up in church. Whew, I didn't expect to tell this story. Um, that was a little weak arm. You hear that? Um, like, well. <laughs> but all of a sudden, I realized that God loved me so much that there was no sin that stood in the way between me and him. And that God loved me so much. I was his child so much that anything that showed up in my life that caused me to draw away from him, God hated it so much. He demonstrated his hatred towards that thing by Jesus' death. You take the, the persecution, the crucifixion of Jesus, that's God's picture of how he feels about sin. And God ripped sin to pieces when Jesus died. And for the first time, after all these years of singing, Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, I realized what that love was for this black boy. And at 19, man, whew, I remember I was in the science building on college campus, walking into that classroom and just thinking about God's love. And I said, holy smokes. And I said, God, I ain't never turning around. I'm, I got my mind made up and I won't go back. And that one in the notes. <laughs> so, and God wants everybody to experience that love. 
He wants you to experience that love. And he wants every single person on the face of this earth to understand his love. And especially those who are in the church, he wants them to experience his love. That's the product. To love one another. So you are not only free from sin, but you are free to give God's love. How are you free to give God's love? Because he's given it to us. Verse 11 says this. For this is the message you've heard from the beginning. Ain't nothing changed. He didn't make up something new. (laughs) John didn't come up with his own, have this new epiphany when he was dipped into the boiling oil when he was shipped to the island of Patmos. He said, this is the same thing that Jesus told us about. The same thing, nothing new. Jesus said this to us as disciples, that you should love one another. This, the game don't change, baby. This is the same game. To love one another. He wants the church to be separated from hate. And he breaks this down in the process. What, what does this process look like of giving this product? We saw the prep. The prep is that we we are his children and we are free from sin. The product is loving one another. So what does the process look like? It says this in verse 12. We must be like, we must not. Let me start over. (laughs) We must not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. The prep, we are his children and his family. He gets down to this process. We're not like Cain who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. Why did he kill him? Because Cain had been doing what was evil and his brother had been doing what was righteous. Please leave that verse on the screen for a second. Cain had been doing what was evil. For those who are in Christ Jesus, we've been freed from sin. You can't continue to sin and be satisfied. You consistently run into them. What did Cain do? Cain was doing what was evil. But if you've done your prep and became God's child or in his family, you understand God's love, you are not Cain, dude. You are not Cain, girl. And his brother had been doing what was righteous. You're free to be hated. That's the process. And you know what? That stuff is ugly. It's ugly. The fact that God loves you, you understand God's love, and people can't understand it, so they're going to hate you? Whew! That's messy, isn't it? You have been hated. I remember one time I was invited to speak to some kids, teenagers, and I was speaking to these teenagers, and they knew what I did. I was a comedian and a preacher. They're like, come do what you do. I started telling jokes to the kids, the kids laughing. Then I started telling them kids that they needed a savior. And whoo, those folks got mad. You knew I was coming? This process is messy. When the world hates you, it's messy. Nobody likes to be hated. And so when Jesus takes us and covers us in Jesus, and he gets to stirring us around and that process of getting us ready and world hating us, it's ugly. And so when we step out into the world, it's hot. People say stuff to us. Talk a lot of noise. And if you've ever been in a fight before Jesus, and people say stuff to you, you're like, boy, you lucky. I know Jesus. So it's ugly. 
the world may hate you. Second thing in this is don't be surprised when this happens. They hated Jesus. They're going to hate you. So don't trip. Remember the first point? Don't forget this. You're his child. Don't forget it. So be free to be hated, but also be free to live. Look at this. Oh. If we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, it proves that we have passed from death to life. The reason, one way I can tell that you indeed know Jesus is because you're able to love your crazy Christian brothers and sisters. Y'all know the crazy Christians I'm talking about, right? If you don't, <laughs> you're one of them, okay? Um, <laughs> And it, it, it's okay. Some of us were homeschooled. <laughs> I homeschooled some of my kids too, so don't, don't, don't get offended, okay? We ho we've homeschooled all six. Cool. I had to transfer. I'm like, y'all don't leave? Wow, y'all need to transfer. Y'all stay at home the whole time. No, but, but in all seriousness, you have some Christians who, who just irritate us, Amen. And what do you do? You're not a Cain who's a child of the evil one. You are a follower of Jesus. You are in God's home, house. You are his child. So you love them. And when you do that, you show that you are alive. And when the world surrounds you, because you truly believe in Jesus, you come out golden. And brown. Sorry if you don't like brown people. <laughs> it's a sign of your love. You say you struggle because you can't see God. You see God when you see your brothers and sisters love each other. When somebody loves you in spite of yourself, that's the love of God. And he sprinkles that goodness on you. Mm, come on, Holy Spirit. Yeah, it's delicious. <laughs> Let's go to this next verse. Look at this. It says, anyone, anyone who hates his brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. Oh, my goodness. If you hate your brother or sister, you are a murderer. You, don't, you have a problem with murder and people killing innocent people. You got a problem. You say that you're pro-life. Because you don't want, you want to protect the unborn babies, but you hate your brothers and sisters in Christ who don't believe like you? Oh, whoa, we going there. Yes, we are. You say that you team Biden and you can't stand people who say that they're Christians and voting for Trump? <laughs> you murderer. You love Trump so much, you say, I don't see how a person can be a Christian and vote for Biden. The oil's hot. Oh my goodness. You murderer. It has nothing to do with your politics. It has everything to do with your perspective on Jesus. Mm. you like, who are you voting for, Jason? I ain't telling you. Shut up. Do you understand the world is out here hating each other? And some people in the church are falling victim to the same trap. Hey, no! You are not this. The church should be separated. If you are God's children, you will be able to love your brother and your sister who thinks different than you do politically. Oh. <laughs> Oh my goodness. And if you cannot sit down and talk to another follower of Jesus who has a different perspective than you do, you need to shift a perspective. I ain't telling you to change your political affiliation, but you better check your kingdom affiliation. Amen. Amen. I'm just, I need to take a break. Oh, my goodness. Mm -mm -mm. Anybody? 
Come on, bro. Come on. Come on up here. Come on. Hurry up. Come on the steps. Come on. Come on the steps. Hurry up, bro. We on the time limit, man. Who? What's your name, man? Matthew. All right. I'm talking. To, I'm not trying to violate space. Matter of fact, hold on. You need a mask? I'm just playing. I'm just playing. All right. All right. All right, Matthew. Have you ever had an Oreo before? I have. Okay. You like Oreos? Okay, cool. Nice fro, too. Thank you. I'm a little jealous. <laughs> Taste one, Matthew. Commentate, though. Commentate. Get you a little bit more powder on it. Yeah, some powder zizzer. Yeah, commentate. Go ahead. Look at the camera. Oh, my goodness. Come on. Father, we thank you right now in the name of Jesus. <laughs> yeah, he, 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 he'll worship. Yeah, come on. Talk to us. Tastes good. Yeah, it tastes good. How's it? Better than the Oreo, right? It is. Your life has been changed forever. Forever. Yeah, come on. Thank you. Give him a hand, y'all. Give him a hand. Thank you. All right. I couldn't keep it to myself, Matthew. <laughs> Verse 16 says this. Look, if you're watching from home, Matthew just took it to his family. And Mama said, oh, my goodness. <laughs> All right. Here we go. We know... What real love is because Jesus gave up his own life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. What does that look like? Sometimes it looks like listening. Sometimes it looks, sometimes it looks like listening. And stop assuming or stop trying to prove your point. Here's what Jesus said in John 13. Verse 34, he says this, just as I have loved you, you should love one another. <laughs> Here's my question. How has Jesus loved you? How? How has Jesus loved you? Right now, I'm, if you're having problems with that, I'm about to help you. Let's do this exercise. Right now, I want you to list in your mind the worst top five sins that you've ever committed go ahead list them the worst the top five most ungodly things you've ever done all right you got them tell them to me out loud <laughs> don't, do that. Don't, don't do that i don't want to know i might not want to shake your hand afterwards um listen how has God loved you? He forgave you for all five like nothing. Jesus, without second thought, recklessly came after you so that that list wouldn't stand before you and God, in between you and God. Here's what Jesus says. You give them the same love. This is not your love to keep. Who are you? That the love that you've received from God, you keep it to yourself, is not your love. And what does Jesus say? Give it away. If you've experienced that you give it to. If you've experienced my grace and being forgiven for the worst things, the most embarrassing things that you would ever do and you won't even want to say out loud, if I've forgiven you for that, you find ways to forgive other people. Woo! You've got these five things that you used to do with great joy and I still listen to you, find ways to listen to somebody else. That's the love. If you have a hard time forgiving your brothers and sisters who know Jesus, you probably have a hard time accepting Jesus' forgiveness. Or maybe you didn't know that his love was reckless like that. So here's what he says in verse 23. John ends 1 John chapter 3 says this and this is his commandment we must believe in the name of Jesus the son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he commanded us
What a powerful message today. If you made that decision to follow Christ, we wanna know. We wanna walk with you through this. We wanna hold your hand through it. Go ahead and text I'm in if you haven't already to the number on your screen so that we can know who you are and walk you through it. And if you've made that decision and you're just feeling called to take another step, or if you haven't taken this step yet and you've made the decision before, we want to baptize you. We're having baptisms coming up and it, those are November 1st, so if you want to sign up for that, please visit goldcreek.org slash baptism, or you can go to our Gold Creek app on the home page and go to the baptism sign up link. And if you don't want to come into the building with us, we highly encourage you to do it at home. We encourage you to take a video and send it to us to jacob at goldcreek.org. We want to celebrate with you. It's a big decision and we don't want to miss it. So please send that to us or sign up if you want to come in November 1st. Those are so fun to get. I love to see the baptism videos. I'm Crystal DeHaunt. I am part of our um, online ministry team here at Gold Creek. And I'm Jordan Funston. And you probably haven't seen me too often, but that's because I am our tech director here at our Mill Creek campus. And I'm usually hiding in the media room upstairs, so you may not usually see me. And you've been around, what, about five years, Jordan, you've been on staff? Five and a half years. I, uh, I interned for a couple of years, and then I was in school as well. So, but yeah, I'm here full time now, and it's been a lot of fun. Full time and newly married. Jordan's starting his life. Yeah, so I think there's a great time where we can dig into the message. Um, it was a great message that Jason brought today. He's just such a dynamic and great preacher. I love listening to him. And I want to dig into this first main point that he made, and that is that God lavishes his love upon us. Like, God has a lot of love that he gives us. And it's a lot like a fatherly love. It's not a lot like a fatherly love. It is the perfect fatherly love. It is the perfect fatherly love. And I think about kids in my life. I have kids in my life that I lavish love on that are not my kids. But, you know, they all walk in the house. They call me mom. They're part of the team. And that's, that's the love that God has for us. So we take on our parents' characteristics a little bit. Yes, I can say that as being newly married and um, my wife and I were talking the other morning and she said that when she was on her phone with her mom, she's like, her mom said, she's so much like her dad. And I was like, you are a lot like, like your dad. I'm sure and that's also, a compliment. Yes, he's an amazing guy. But then she's also a lot like her mom. Like, she cares far too much. And I always tell her, you, you care far too much because your mom cares far, far too much. And then she gets her creativity and her, she likes working with tools and stuff. She gets that from her dad. And, and I get a lot of character characteristics from my mom and dad. And it's just, it's funny how we recognize that the more we look for it. So how do we look for that? Here's, here's the key. How do you at home look like our Heavenly Father? Is it lavishing love on people? Is it graciousness, kindness? Go ahead and drop it in the chat. How do you look like your Heavenly Father? And I think this is a great segue into our next point that is God sent Jesus to take away our sins. And Jesus was the perfect human being. And because of this, sin is powerless over us. What an incredible thought. Sin is powerless over us. I don't think we think that when we're sinning. It's hard to remember. It's hard to know. Um, and really, we have to, the first step in recognizing this is just bringing our sins to God. Like, we need to, it's different when we recognize it from when then to when we bring it to God and we put it out and we let it out in the open. Well, really, it's trusting God. It's giving it to Him and trusting Him to take care of it for you. We can't do it in our own strength or our own responsibility. It has to come from God. Yeah, and so what do you need, what do you need to remove from your life? What do you need God to help you remove from your life? And really, we only need to ask Him to help us and we don't he helps have us, to just like you would help your children, right? Yeah. 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 So our last kind of section we want to focus on here when Jason's message is he mentions that we're commanded to love one another. And I want to emphasize that word that we are commanded to love one another. It's not, you know, a suggestion or a guideline, but it's you must love one another. And that's really hard to do in this season, I feel like, especially in personal relationships with people who we don't even know, with other people online or people in driving the lane next to you. Either. So how do we do that? 
Number one, show graciousness. Be gracious as our Heavenly Father is gracious to us. Um, forgiveness. Boy, that's a hard one sometimes. It's important to remember you, you don't have to agree. You don't have to say something is okay to forgive someone for it and move on and show them love, I think. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. And it's really a radical love that we're being called to have. And how do we even apply this? Um, it's easy to go, we should just love one another, but then where in our lives can we realistically apply this? Like, what are we not currently doing that we could be doing? And I know for me at home, and it's gonna sound silly, and many of you might relate, but for me to radically love my wife could just be to clean up my side of the bed. And I can do that in five minutes. Like, I know it drives her insane and it bothers her, and I do it every once in a while. Come on, Jordan, get it done. I know, but... <laughs> That's just a silly small thing that I could do to help show radical love towards my spouse and help invest in that relationship and help show um, acts of service and just dive into those love languages. And... For me, radical love is it's um, relationships. It's being in relationships with people. It's noticing who looks lonely, who needs help, who who feel who can I get close to. Like, how can I show anyone and everyone in my life love? That's what I'm going to try to do this week. So we want to know how you're playing it out this week. DM us, Facebook message us. Anytime you show radical love, throw it in the comments right now how you plan to do it. We want to know how you're living it out this week.